Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to view this presentation on early childhood mental health. We believe that the adoption of these core competencies into practice will improve the outcomes for children with behavioral health needs and their families. These foundational modules are developed to be viewed by family members, higher education students, paraprofessionals, and professionals. A list of resources and references have also been provided. This module will be presented by Ellen Schreiber at Community Bridges. The New Hampshire Children's Behavioral Health Workforce Development Network is to build a sustainable infrastructure for the professional development of the children's behavioral health workforce based upon the core competencies and infused with the system of care core values and guiding principles. The need is for New Hampshire to have an adequate workforce and an infrastructure to support those who work with children, youth, and families. The New Hampshire Children's Behavioral Health Core Competencies were developed in 2011 by a representation of diverse stakeholder groups, including child-serving community mental health providers, family organizations, state policymakers, and university staff. The goal was that the competencies would be the first step in developing systematic and comprehensive human services development infrastructure. The competencies were developed using the system of care core values and principles as the foundation. There are seven domains, family-driven and youth-guided practice, cultural and linguistic competence, childhood development and disorders, screening assessment and referral, treatment planning, interventions and service delivery, systems knowledge and collaboration, and quality improvement. The competencies are organized for professional staff by levels of knowledge and skills in each domain. There are three levels, foundational, intermediary, and advanced. The levels are designed to identify the skill level of practitioners. They are fluid and not specifically tied to certain formal education and training or position titles. A copy of the report can be accessed and a link is provided at the end of this presentation. This is one of a series of modules designed to support the development of core competencies in the children's behavioral health workforce. This module on early childhood mental health addresses foundational competencies in the domains of systems knowledge and collaboration, community resources and foundational and intermediate competencies in the domains of childhood development and disorders, child and adolescent development, more specifically, it provides critical information about basic neurodevelopment, the importance of attachment, red flags for attachment concerns, and describes the effects of toxic stress. The module also provides an overview of the early childhood system and offers community resources for young children and their families. This presentation is about early childhood mental health. Early childhood experiences are very important. Experiences during the first few years of life, all experiences, good and bad, literally shape the brain and how it develops. Early relationships define our working model for relationships in life and our expectations of the world around us. Infants and toddlers require a safe base in order to be able to freely explore and learn from their environment. In our earliest relationships, we learn co-regulation. This is the ability to calm ourselves and manage sensation and emotion. This impacts us throughout our life. A secure attachment relationship mitigates negative impacts of stress and trauma. In fact, the existence of a secure attachment relationship is the greatest protective factor against the development of post-traumatic stress disorder. So what is infant mental health? Infant mental health is a complex multidisciplinary field built on the understanding that supporting children, families, and the parent-infant relationship and promoting protective factors helps to build resilience and improves outcomes for young children and their families. In a nutshell, proactive is better than reactive. It is much more effective to help parents understand, protect, and care for their children in the early years than it is to remediate compounded issues years down the road. Infant mental health addresses all the developmental, medical, relational, fami familial, societal issues that impact the well-being of infants and young children. 
In order to fully understand and address the needs of young children, one needs a working knowledge of neurodevelopment, child development, family systems, parent-child interaction, and an understanding of the impact of social issues and adult issues, such as mental illness, substance abuse, domestic violence, and trauma. Prenatal experiences impact development. Early experience begins prenatally, when factors such as exposure to chronic maternal stress, nutrition, and exposure to toxic substances, such as drugs and alcohol, affect vulnerability. Positive influences during prenatal period include low stress, good health, and nutrition, the presence of a supportive relationship for the mother, and the absence of toxic exposure. In infancy, it's about attachment. The quality of the primary caregiver infant attachment relationship sets the stage for a child's expectations about the world around him or her, and it defines his working model for relationships from that point forward. Secure attachments support a sense of security, curiosity, and a desire to explore the world. This has implications for cognitive, motor, social, and communication development. In the first three years of life, a child's brain is developing at a rapid rate and it is shaped to a large degree by the experiences the child has. A strong attachment relationship mitigates the impact of trauma. And supporting optimal brain development. During fetal development, the basic brain structures are developed by about 25 weeks gestation. Brain cells grow through a process called neurogenesis, literally the growth of neurons. We're born with pretty much all the neurons we'll ever have, about 10 billion, but the processes that occur after birth impact how the brain functions. Key processes are synaptogenesis, the growing connections between brain cells, pruning, withering of connections through lack of use, and myelination, the growth of the myelin sheath, a fatty insulation of the nerve axon, which speeds processing. Through experience, our brains are shaped. Repeated experience leads to thicker dendrite growth and the reinforcing of some synapses, while lack of experience prunes others. Here you see a picture of two neurons with dendrites growing off the axons. More experience leads to thicker dendrite growth, allowing for more synaptic connections. Babies are wired to get the input they need for optimal brain development through typical interactions with a nurturing caregiver in a safe environment. This brief video demonstrates how typical parent-infant interactions support brain development. Pruning is a normal and necessary process. An example of how this works is with language development. We're born with the ability to learn and speak any language. Through exposure to just certain sounds, we eventually restrict our capacity. Pruning also occurs when typical experiences do not happen. For instance, children living in a language-impoverished environment develop less capacity for language. We know that severe deprivation significantly impacts brain development, learning, language, and social skills. You can actually see brain activation differences on an MRI. In severe situations, the actual size of the brain is affected. Our knowledge of neurodevelopment has grown tremendously in the past 10 years. We now know with certainty that early childhood experiences have far-reaching implications for later mental health, physical well-being, social, and relational success. We have evidence of how early experience or lack of experience actually shapes the brain. We know that chronic exposure to toxic stress negatively impacts brain development. It wires the brain to be hyper-aroused and hyper-vigilant, interfering with learning and attention and increasing the likelihood of behavioral issues. It's important to understand the impact of trauma and toxic stress. Stress is unavoidable in life. It can be described as normal, tolerable, or toxic. Normal stress is part of our typical experience and offers opportunities for growth. An example of this is the stress a young child experiences when beginning childcare. The child feels stressed but is able to use coping skills and master the situation. After a while, the experience is no longer stressful. Tolerable stress challenges our coping skills but is manageable in the context of a supportive environment. For example, a child has to adjust to the death of a parent. This is clearly disruptive and a long-term stressor but it can be manageable with the support of an emotionally available and sensitive caregiver. Toxic stress is chronic and extreme and overwhelms the child's defenses in the absence of a secure supportive relationship. 
So if you think about that same child experiencing the loss of a parent, but this time in the context of an unpredictable environment with no available safe caregiver, that is toxic stress. Living in an environment of fear or perceived threat to safety can cause toxic stress. Because the availability of a consistent and nurturing attachment figure is so important in early childhood, the lack of availability of an attachment figure, frequent disruptions of the attachment relationship, or safety risks for the attachment figure can all be experienced as traumatic and potentially as toxic stress for the young child. Children experiencing toxic stress show structural and functional differences in their brain development. It is important to understand the impact of chronic stress on the brain. Chronic stress impacts hormones in the brain. Although several hormones are affected and impact the brain in complex ways, the one most commonly talked about is cortisol. Cortisol is known as the stress hormone. Under typical circumstances, cortisol rises in a crisis situation it helps your body and brain focus on the immediate situation at hand, and then it returns to normal when the crisis is passed. Infants and young children who live in chronically unsafe and unpredictable circumstances experience toxic stress and have atypical elevated cortisol levels. When cortisol remains elevated, it acts as a toxic bath for the brain and body. If the stress is constant, the body eventually stops going back to baseline, and the state of fight or flight becomes a trait. These children are in chronic crisis mode. They are more reactive to their environment. They get distressed more easily and are harder to calm down. This interferes with learning, memory, and has significant implications for relationships and behavior. We know that stress levels have strong implications for physical health as well. In a recent study called the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences, conducted by the CDC, it was demonstrated that the frequency of adverse experience in childhood predicts serious health outcomes for later life. The impact is exponential rather than linear, so having one or two adverse experiences in childhood does not significantly impact health outcomes, but as the number of events increases, the severity of the impact rises sharply. You can take the ACE yourself at acestudy.org. The ACE study conducted by the CDC in the 1980s and 90s found that adverse childhood experiences are strongly related to the development and prevalence of risk factors for disease and social well-being throughout the lifespan. John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth described attachment as a deep and enduring emotional bond that connects one person to another across time and space. One characteristic of attachment is that it is unique to each dyad. That is to say that the quality of the attachment relationship between a child and one parent can be very different than the quality of the attachment relationship between that child and another parent. Beginning in the 1950s and through the 70s, through the work of Anna Freud, Renee Spitz, Harry Harlow, John Bowlby, Mary Ainsworth, and Mary Maine, we began to understand the need for comfort and nurturance is as primary a need as other basic drives, such as hunger. For this, you can see the work of ha Harry Harlow in 1958. And the lack of presence of a safe and nurturing attachment figure has serious implications for development. For this, look at the work of Renee Spitz in 1952. In the beginning of the 60s, John Bowlby was the first to begin extensive research on attachment between humans and infants and the primary caregiver. He defined four distinguishing observable characteristics of attachment. Proximity maintenance, safe haven behavior, secure base behavior, and separation distress. Bowlby made three key propositions about attachment theory. First, he suggested that when children are raised with confidence that their primary caregiver will be available to them, they are less likely to experience fear than those who are raised without such conviction. This confidence is forged during the critical period of development during the early years and children develop expectations about their world based on the experiences they have in their attachment relationship in their early years. In the 1970s, Mary Ainsworth, who is a researcher and colleague of John Bowlby's, further expanded upon his groundbreaking work in her now famous Strange Situations study. This study involved observing children between the ages of 12 to 18 months during a protocol in which attachment behaviors were elicited. 
Four categories of behaviors are measured and observed during this protocol. First, separation anxiety, the distress the infant shows when left by the caregiver. Second, the infant's willingness to explore. Third, stranger anxiety, which is the infant's response to the presence of a stranger. And lastly, the reunion behavior, which is the child's ability to use the parent to comfort themselves when stressed and then their ability to resume play. Based on her observations, she defined three different types of attachment styles. The secure attachment, in which the child is able to use the parent to calm themselves and then resume play. The ambivalent insecure attachment style during which the child appears ambivalent or even angry and has difficulty using the parent to calm themselves and return to play. And lastly, the avoidant insecure attachment style in which the child may appear not even to react to the parent's return or actively avoids the parent's attempts to comfort them. In the 1980s, Mary Main and Judith Solomon furthered Ainsworth's work on attachment styles by adding a fourth attachment style, known as disorganized insecure attachment. In observing a disorganized attachment style, you will see at the point of reunion that rather than going to the parent for comfort, the child freezes, acts in contradictory ways, shows stiffness and or regression. The child is not able to use the parent to comfort themselves. This attachment style is most concerning. It is believed to occur when the attachment figure, the one who is supposed to be providing comfort, is on some level scary to the child. The child is therefore conflicted because the person who is supposed to be comforting them is also a source of increased anxiety. Although there are cultural differences in attachment styles, there is strong evidence that a disorganized attachment style is predictive of relational issues and behavioral concerns. Here you will see a video showing different attachment styles demonstrated during the separation phase of the strange situation protocol. This experiment, which I watched through a two-way mirror, is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. Okay, this bunny is going to go here, and that bunny will be on top. The value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child, one year old, and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother, get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. But you see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in the toys. Now she has a contact with the mother, She's beginning to show a little interest in the environment, and shortly she'll be right back with the toys where we started. So you would call this a secure one? Yes, yes. She's certainly much happier. Goes to the door following her. Now, we, we sent the mother right back in, but the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face in a sad expression, puts her face down, when she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out, and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's, he's low-keyed. So you would call the, this insecure Yes, attachment. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's not engaging her, and it's not being, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence, her her return should be the solution to his problem. Now this is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure, but you'll see we get a look at his play before the separation. 
Mother's left. When she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Do Given the importance of attachment in the parent-infant relationship, it's no surprise that supporting the parent-infant relationship is a primary focus in infant mental health. This includes helping parents to understand themselves, their history, and what they are bringing to the parenting role. Helping parents to understand the world through their child's eyes and supporting patterns of interaction that strengthen attachment, such as attunement, reciprocity, and interactive repair. Attunement refers to co-regulation, reading the child's cues, and matching, that is, responding to the child in harmony. Reciprocity refers to the back and forth nature of interaction and mutual reward. But not always are we in harmony with our attachment figure. Then there are disconnects, and much is to be gained through reconnecting and in interactive repair. This presentation has really dealt with the impact of experience, but we do know that experience is not the only thing that matters. Genetic predisposition also plays a significant role in development. Once people asked, is it nature or nurture? We now understand that there is a complex interplay between the two. Even if your work is not with young children, for any mental health professional, it is important to remember Early childhood experience has many implications for later mental health. For any person with a presenting problem, it is essential to gather comprehensive history that includes pregnancy and birth history, early medical concerns, early childhood development, attachment history, exposure to trauma, and the quality of the primary caregiver-infant relationship. And now we're going to talk about the early childhood system of care. New Hampshire has an active early childhood system of care. There are a wide range of services available throughout the state which interweave to create a web of support for young children and their families. Key programs to be aware of include Early Supports and Services, which serves eligible children birth to age 3 and their families. Eligibility is based on a delay of 33% or more in any area of development, atypical behavior, a condition known to cause a delay, or meeting five at-risk criteria. Services include developmental therapies, parent education and support, and service coordination. Services are home and community-based. Referrals can be made to the Area Agency for Developmental Services in your region. Preschool Special Education provides special education services to children ages 3 through 5. Eligibility is determined through an evaluation by the local school district preschool special education team. The Division of Children, Youth, and Families provides child protection services and determines abuse and neglect, provides family support, permanency planning, foster care planning, and or adoption as needed. This is particularly important because children under age three are at the greatest risk of child abuse. Child care. Thousands of children are in child care in New Hampshire, and many spend long hours there, making it a very important component of the early childhood system. Programs like Child Care Resource and Referral can help parents find licensed child care centers. For those of us working with young children and families, collaborating with and supporting child care providers and maintaining high-quality services for young children is essential to a child's success. Home visiting programs such as Healthy Families America provide home visiting for at-risk families from pregnancy until age 3. And medical services. Medical providers, including but not limited to doctors, hospitals, and visiting nurses, are part of the early childhood service system. Research by the New Hampshire Association for Infant Mental Health found that the doctor's office is the first place a parent goes when they have concerns about their child's behavior. Most medical providers provide developmental screening and screening for autism as well. In closing, I'd like to share with you some state and national resources for early childhood. The website for the New Hampshire Association for Infant Mental Health, 
the Spark New Hampshire Early Learning website and the Early Education Intervention Network of New Hampshire website. National resources include Zero to Three, The Developing Child at Harvard, Child Trauma Academy, the National Childhood Traumatic Stress Network, and the Center for Social Emotional Development. These are all excellent sites that can provide you with up-to-date information and resources regarding the needs of young children. This presentation was brought to you by Ellen Schreiber. I'd like to thank the New Hampshire Association for Infant Mental Health, Community Bridges, and the Endowment for Health. Together, we can make a brighter future for young children and their families in New Hampshire.